the advanced economies need to be out of coal uh, by 2030 and the whole world by 2050. If we don't uh, take huge steps to decarbonize and clean up our economy in the next 12 years, then we start to get some enormous impacts uh, beyond the already huge impacts we're seeing today. The new targets for increased energy efficiency and increased renewables are based at EU level, not at national level. So each member state has to make sure that what it does contributes to the overall goals and these targets. By incentivizing renewable power, by um, making a level playing field for the kind of new clean up fuels to come in, we uh, could start to see a rebalancing. The standout example of transitioning away from coal is really the UK. And it's remarkable how rapid that's been. We had uh, coal-fired power in the UK in 1882. All through uh, the last 140 years or so, it's been a massive part of our economic story. We uh, realised that coal was such a big uh, polluter, we began to understand climate change much better. The government introduced a historic piece of legislation in 2008, which was the world's first binding uh, climate change legislation, committing us uh, to reduce our emissions by 80% by 2050. The carbon intensity of the UK power sector has halved in the period 2013 to 2017, and that is just based on the, the generation mix and how that has changed over that period. The politics lined up behind this idea and they put the mechanisms in place that have successfully delivered that. We brought in a number of measures like a, a carbon price to properly reflect the, the pollution that you get from coal. We brought in measures to help renewables uh, get started. And really those mechanisms are ones that have priced coal out of the market increasingly. And now we're in a situation where even though the announced date to be rid of coal in the UK is, is 2025, I think we're going to see increasingly close to zero coal in the market. We're here in National Grid System Operators Electricity National Control Centre and this is where we do the real-time activity of meeting, uh, matching supply with demand 24-7, uh, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Energy security is, is one of those things that the, the lights must stay on, so it's something that you absolutely have to be sure that you're going to be able to manage and that we do this uh, in an affordable way and that we facilitate the transition over time to a more sustainable energy system. The power system is going through a period of huge change and having a low carbon grid is a vital element of plans to decarbonise the economy. Where we've obliged companies to source renewable energy, we've also uh, introduced uh, a guarantee for renewables companies that they will receive a certain price not a subsidy, but a certain price that will encourage them that they have a long-term future in the sector. So renewables companies have really responded to these incentives. In the UK now, uh, offshore wind is cheaper than building new gas or having coal or having nuclear power. So very quickly, by setting in place a policy framework that gives renewable companies certainty that there's a market place, um, the costs have fallen and now it is uh, the, the cheapest, the cleanest, and in terms of job creation, the most diffuse source of energy in our country. Renewables are playing an increasingly important part. We've seen uh, wind generation, uh, really those levels really increase, and we've seen increasing levels of solar generation as well uh, on the system, so we now have a really strong mix of renewables. So in April 2018, we had the system running for 76 hours without any coal generation uh, for the first time since the Industrial Revolution. And this is due to increasing levels of renewables coming onto the system. And as we go forward, that's only likely to increase. In fact, the amount of hours that the system has run without coal has clocked up to over 1,500. We brought in measures to help renewables uh, get started. And we've had a huge uh, offshore wind revolution The obvious challenge with lots of wind and solar is that there are times when the wind's not blowing and the sun's not shining. And this is a material problem. The challenges of keeping the system in balance as we look at increasing levels of renewable generation have got more difficult undoubtedly because a lot of that renewable generation is variable. Its output is dependent on the weather to, to a large extent. And therefore the challenges that the system operator faces around how do you match supply and demand in real time have increased 
uh, over the last while. The UK has a number of electricity interconnectors with other European countries that are operating today and a number of other ones that are under development uh, into the future. These provide a number of benefits. So we have uh, interconnectors between the island of GB and continental Europe, uh, to France and to Holland at the moment, and then also to the Republic and to Northern Ireland. They provide added security of supply, but also they increase the ability to manage variable renewable supply in the UK, but also with our neighbours as well. It, it gives them the opportunity to balance it as well. Um, so overall, they increase the flexibility of, of the system and give you that added resilience in terms of security of supply. So we think about a wind farm, when it's windy, you're going to get lots of outputs, and that might be the time when people don't actually want to use that generation. If you can store that, then you can keep it and sell it back to them when they might need it. So we're starting to see more and more storage on the system. As more people are understanding there is a market out there, they could you know, uh, partner up with a wind generator or with solar arms as well. So we're now mature in our experience of managing uh, wind generation. Um, we have really good forecasting models of what the output will be, which helps us understand what the variability and intermittency might look like. We have a number of new balancing services to help us manage that. And we're now increasingly seeing providers come forward with wind generation plus the battery so they can self-smooth and self-correct their output and manage that themselves. The UK was the first country to set legislation that forced its economy to change and reduced our carbon budgets. But what we found was it was extremely good for the economy. If you want to build an offshore wind farm, you need to build the equipment and install it at sea first. But then you have to maintain it for 25, 30 years, maybe even longer. There are now more than 400,000 low carbon uh, jobs in the economy. That's growing incredibly fast. Suddenly these jobs that are being created are highly skilled. They're long term jobs. So they're very valuable jobs. And these jobs vary from operating boats, operating vessels, you could be a wind turbine technician, or you could be making the advanced or most advanced blades in the world for wind turbines in your local town. And now suddenly offshore wind has totally rejuvenated places like Hull, for example. Hull itself is about the seventh biggest city in England. Hull is an example of a city that faced major transitions away from a fossil fuel-based economy, a fisheries uh, economy. Well, originally, uh, one of the uh, coal had a, uh, a massive part to play on the Humber, so a third of the UK's coal was, was brought in through the Humber. The fishing industry on the Humber was predominantly a, a huge industry. I mean, both Hull and Grimsby um, operate the two biggest fishing ports in the world. You know, it was always said that for every one person at sea, there was seven support staff required ashore. Well, I think it was uh, uh, very tough in Hull as the uh, industries uh, fell away and communities found it very hard to find new jobs and get skilled up. Uh, it was an incredibly tough process. And now we're seeing some of the most exciting developments in Europe with its leadership on offshore wind. Lots of changes, yeah. I mean, obviously we've got Siemens that's opened up next door to us. Um, there's Orsted uh, uh, across in Grimsby. Overall, you kind of can see that the place has really started to, to grow and develop and become a really quite exciting place to be now. And I think it's been quite um, key, this kind of renewable energy revolution that's kind of come into the Humber. The Humber's perfectly placed for offshore wind. Uh, geographically, it's in the kind of centre of the existing proposed offshore wind farms. We're putting offshore wind turbines into the North Sea 100 times faster than when we first started. So if you're looking for productivity in the economy, if you're looking for a clean, green source of energy, then this is a really exciting story. Ersted in the UK have now 11 operational wind farms with two wind farms in construction. You've got this heritage of, of marine and maritime activity and we, you know, there's been ports in the Humber you know, for over 100 years and they can be adapted to this new industry. For other regions around the world, if you've got an existing uh, maritime workforce, then uh, they can transition into offshore wind quite, quite easily. Uh, I'm a fourth generation uh, shipbuilders. Um, my dad, my granddad, my great granddad was all from uh, Gold Shipbuilding Yard. And my niece actually works for me now, so she's a fifth generation. And I started this company up 30 years ago in 1988. So we've started from, there's maybe just a handful of men, literally six, 
and we went up to about 100 people all together. We've got engineering departments, uh, painting departments, fabrication and welding departments, a joinery department. So originally when we first started, there was quite a lot of fishing boats still running out of Hull and Grimsby. So predominantly we had regular work on the fishing vessels. Yeah, unfortunately that, that, has, that has gone now. Um, obviously with offshore wind we're all hoping and I'm quite sure there's lots of opportunities for us to take and grasp the while they're available. The vessel which we'll be getting delivered shortly is a, is a nearly new vessel. Uh, we have a new vessel under construction in here which will be ready for uh, around July next year and that's a survey vessel which will be able to be used within offshore wind. We're very keen to create new business um, and we're more than willing to take anything on apart from ships including the wind farm. I think one of the most important issues we've got within the maritime industry, certainly in this country, is not losing our skills base. You know, the people that build ships, repair ships, that sail the vessels are highly qualified, and it's important that we get a throughput of young people working within this industry. And really, with the wind farm industry now, it is creating a lot more opportunities for this to happen. In Europe, we want to make sure that the transition away from coal helps also to create new jobs for those families and people dependent on coal jobs. Uh, my grandfather died in a coal mine, so I know that working in a coal mine is not the most safe kind of work one can do. The message for the Humber is, you know, this, this is a really important region. It's the center of this, this opportunity for in offshore wind in the UK. It's got a lot of things that have happened so far. It's got a lot further to grow. And all those benefits, that, that employment, that investment, that improving of the town and place to live, work, play, etc. You know, it's all really good stuff. So, um, yeah, really positive message for the future of offshore wind um, in this region. What we've been told is that, you know, we're kind of blueprint, really, for creating jobs from renewable energy. The world is changing. We need to be at the crest of that wave, not, not behind it. And I think that's what the UK has done well. They want to be on the crest of that wave and recognising the change in technology and the change of opportunity. Um, but it's required the politicians and the rule makers to see that as well and to, and to come together on it. We have seen the benefits of transitioning uh, very rapidly to renewable power. And we can see the opportunity to do that around the world. And it's great for our economy, for our jobs, for our skills. It's also just necessary and urgent for our climate. So I see our role now as working with others to see how we can accelerate that transition around the world in a way that is good for those economies and good for those citizens and those businesses. Once we brought communities and businesses and government officials together and set in place some good policies, we saw an extraordinarily rapid shift to a cleaner, um, greener model. So it can be done. The challenge is enormous, it's unprecedented in human history, but it can be done when people get together and, and understand what's needed and work together to make sure that they ensure it's fair for everybody. It can be done and it has to be done.